All right. Well, let me say good morning and welcome to Phoenix Seventh Day Baptist Church. This is uh, what the third third time we've been in in this room, I think. Uh, really, uh, I don't know about you, but I'm really enjoying being here so far. Um, before we start, I want to say to, to to anyone who is joining us online. Um, if you've seen these last couple times that we've been here, I don't know if you've noticed these these uh, sim six symbols here that are up on the wall behind me. If you're wondering what those are, in fact, somebody today is wondering what those are, uh, I can just say this is the Christian gospel symbolized. Uh, for those of us who are here, uh, on the, the two walls, the two side walls here is where these symbols are explained. There are some banners there that explain what each of these means. And basically it's the Christian faith uh, the, from creation, this end, to eternity on this end. So, you know, maybe sometime we can look at those. But it's nice to be meeting in a place where people understand the gospel of Christ. Right. Father, we do thank you for the, the gift of faith that you have given to us so that we can believe in Jesus and we can have eternal life. Lord, we also thank you for another Sabbath, another reminder of eternal life that has already started and eternal rest is coming someday. Bless our time together. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You have a Bible? Uh, scripture was from Exodus 19. Read the first six verses. Um, you might want to keep that open. We might mention a thing or two about that later. Exodus 19. In the third month after the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on the, on the same day they came to the wilderness of Sinai, for they had departed from Rephidim and come to the wilderness of Sinai and camp in the wilderness. So Israel camped there before the mountain, and Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people. All the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. Praise. Lord God, as we pray for your mercy and your grace, we just want to thank you for your mercy and your grace. We've already received so much from you. We just praise you for it. Father, thank you especially for the Lord Jesus, our Savior, and our only hope. We thank you that you have been answering our prayers. Goodness, we thank you for providing this meeting place. For we thank you for at least a few of us were able to enjoy a weekend retreat with other Timothy Baptists last week in California. 
thank you for hearing all of our prayers as we, as we pray for each other, for the uh, illnesses and conditions that, that uh, give us difficulty in this life. We just want to thank you that you have it all in your hands. And just thank you for your watch care, your protection over all of us. Father, we're asking you to provide a pastor for our church. I want to thank you for it in advance. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's just uh, continue praying with this next song. Uh, this is the Lord's Prayer. Of course, he told us that's a prayer we're supposed to pray. So we can do that while we're singing. And this one. You know, Lord's Prayer has been set to music many times, and this is one that I'd never heard before. And they threw in a few other prayers along with the Lord's Prayer. Uh, I think we'll recognize this tune when we sing it. Lord, we pray. You probably don't think of yourself as a priest. But according to the Bible, you are. You know, we Protestant Christians have always believed in something that's called the priesthood of all believers. Ever heard that expression? But where did we get that? Well, it all started back in Old Testament Israel, right from the time they were leaving Egypt and becoming a nation. A little while ago, we heard the, the main scripture in Exodus 19, where God told the people of Israel that they would be a kingdom of priests. Well, this raises a question that a lot of Christians have always wondered about, still do. What is the relationship between the Christian church and the people of Israel. Now, when I say Israel, I don't mean that country over there in the Middle East. I mean the people of Israel, the Jewish people. What is our relationship with them? Are they still the chosen people? <laughs> are Christians and Jews more or less equal? far as God is concerned? Has the Christian church replaced Israel as God's people? You know, I haven't checked this out, but, but my guess is that in the world today, there are a lot more Christians than there are Jews. Does anybody know for sure? I, I think that's the case, but I've never checked it out. Of course, Israel has existed more than twice as long as the Christian church. Uh, most of the ancient people groups have all died out, but the Jews are still here. That's significant. Is God keeping them around for a reason? No. Christians believe that the, the you know, Promises of the end time are all about Jesus. Indeed, they should be. We look forward to his coming again. There are promises for Israel, too. Some of those promises still need to be fulfilled before the end. People of Israel and the Christian church, both created by God, I can ask it this way, does God like one of his children more than the other? What we read in Exodus 19 was right after the Exodus itself, right near the beginning, their 40-year trip to the promised land. In this chapter, we're, we're not even up to the Ten Commandments yet. So this is still very early in the history of Israel. But here was God telling these people what he wanted them to 
to come. He had big plans for them. If I may say so, from what we read here, I get the impression that God was planning to change the world through these ex-slaves. Now, I guess I'm getting ahead of myself here, but God did change the world through Israel, or at least he started to. In the rest of the books of Moses, God gave them all sorts of laws telling them how to live, how to relate to him, how to relate to each other and to the surrounding nations. And it went on like that for many centuries. There were lots of problems along the way, of course. Well, disobedience and rebellion, then God's punishment, then God restoring them to himself again, then doing the whole thing all over again. On and on like that, century after century. Was it all going somewhere? Well, we know that it was. Through Israel, God was preparing the way for sending his son, and his son came in through Israel. Jesus was a Jew as well as the Son of God. And through him, God really has changed the world. We know that now. I'm grateful for that now. But back here in Exodus 19, the focus is on the, the people of Israel themselves. Now they were no longer a bunch of slaves were becoming a nation created by God for specific purposes. Some of those purposes are listed here in this chapter. Let's just look at them quickly to, to try to see just what was God expecting from these people. First, what I see is he expected obedience. It's in verse 5. If you obey me, well, of course. How could it be any different? After all, he's the creator. He's the king. Now, this might have been tough for a lot of these people. I mean, haven't they already done enough obeying back in Egypt? When they were slaves? When they didn't have a choice? After all that, don't they deserve a little freedom now? Yes. Now they were free. But the freest person in the world is still needs to be under authority. Even if there was a king of the world, he would have to be under God's authority. He would still have to obey. We might as well learn it now. We haven't already. We're always going to have to obey someone. So let's do it with all our heart, especially obey God. If we will do that, then, oh, just like he said here, if Israel would obey God and keep his covenant, they would be his special treasure. Now, literally, that means valued property, or treasured possession. Well, that's a great thing to know that God sees his people as treasure, as valuable to him. Now, this, you always need to understand, this isn't talking about stuff like, you know, positive self-image. No, it's not because of us that God treasures us. It's because of him and his love for us. He created for himself. Please remember, we can't be a treasured possession without being a possession. It doesn't work if we don't acknowledge that God owns us. We need to live like we know he does. 
Verse 6 here has the, the zinger, it seems to me. Maybe two of them. So I'm pretty sure that when it says kingdom of priests and holy nation, it will be two ways of saying the same thing. God was expecting this new nation of Israel to be holy, and he was expecting them to serve him as priests. Now, later on, just a few chapters later in this book of Exodus, God took the family of Aaron and set them up as priests, the high priests of Israel. Serve God first at the tabernacle and then later on at the temple. But that doesn't contradict us. Aaron's family was special, but God saw all of his people as priests. He expected all of them to serve, keep the covenant. Sometimes they did, sometimes they didn't. But then many years later, something new happened. Jesus Christ came into the world bringing a new covenant. The Bible calls him a high priest. And what's kind of amazing, he is also the lamb who was slain. Now, 40 years after, after his death and resurrection, there was no more temple. And so, no more animal sacrifices. So, did the whole priest thing just go away? Is there no longer a kingdom of priests? Let's look at what Jesus said about it. Let's find Matthew chapter 21. That's where we're going to go for the rest of this time. Matthew 21. chapter starts with Jesus entering Jerusalem. It's usually called the triumphal entry. Uh, this is, of course, just a few days before he was crucified. During that time, he had some confrontations with the Jewish leaders, and he told some parables that were very critical of the way they were treating him. And then he said something to them that I want us to hear. This is verse 43, Matthew 21, 43. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing fruits. Now, I hope I'm not reading too much into this, but it sure sounds like he was taking the kingdom, including the kingdom of priests, <laughs> taking the kingdom from Israel and giving it to, well, who? Oh. Jesus said it was people with bare fruit. Well, that should remind us of a number of scriptures coming later on in this book. New Testament talks quite a lot about Christians bearing fruit. Several of the, of the New Testament writers talked about this. The Holy Spirit produces fruit in Christians, and we are supposed to produce good fruit when we work and when we serve. Peter even called the Christian church a royal priesthood. That's in 1 Peter 2, 9. Bearing fruit is part of the priesthood. Believers in Christ are, are called to fulfill the, the original call to Israel in Exodus 19. Now, I wouldn't exactly call it plan B because God, you know, God always had the church in mind. He, that was part of his plan even from the very beginning. 
But as members of the Christian church, we need to know that God expects us to be a kingdom of priests, the priesthood of all believers, if you like that old Protestant phrase better. We are all to serve God as priests. Never forget that Jesus told us one very important way how to serve God. That's by serving other people. Never going to have any shortage of opportunity for that. Let me tell you a story about something that happened, goodness, I guess all, almost 25 years ago now. Um, now, I'm sure I've told you that for the last 17 years or so that, that we were in California, I had a job as a technical writer along with uh, being part-time pastor of our church. I worked for a Japanese company that had their, their main software office was in the United States. And that's where I worked. One day, uh, just a few weeks after I had started that job, there was a visitor coming to our office. This was a VIP from the parent company in Japan. So every, you know, that day everybody had to dress a little nicer than usual and everything had to be very neat on our desks. Um, uh, big deal. Our general manager at that time, uh, everybody called him Mr. Yuki. Uh, and and of course, he was Japanese himself. Mr. Yuki took this VIP visitor around from, from cube to cube and office to office and, and introduced him to, to everybody one by one. Now, there were only 25 people at the office then, so, so that didn't take real long. Anyway, when they got to me, Mr. Yuki told him my name and, and then talked for a couple minutes. In Japanese, of course. So I had no idea what he was saying. You know, maybe, maybe he was telling the VIP that I had, that I had just started there a few weeks earlier and, and instantly became the oldest person in the office. And that was true. Or maybe he was just telling him what a great employee I was. I really don't know what he was saying. Anyway, at one point, Mr. Yuki paused, and it looked to me like, like he was kind of searching for the right word. So he turned to me and said, Priest? Well, then I knew he was telling the man what kind of work I had already been doing before I started working there. So I said, Pastor. Mr. Yuki said, ah, pastor. And then he continued on in Japanese. You know what? Mr. Yuki was right. I am a priest. According to the Bible, I am a priest. You are a priest. I'm not saying that Israel doesn't count anymore. The fact that they still exist, says that God still cares for them. New Testament says he still has plans for them. But Jesus said he has taken the kingdom from Israel and given it to people who will produce fruit. If, if believers in Christ don't do that, nobody will. Let's work with him to do what we can as his priests. Allow the Spirit of God to produce fruit in us so that we can be effective priests, effective servants, bearing fruit out there in the world. I mentioned Aaron earlier, the very first high priest. Oh, you know, one of the things Aaron is famous for is a blessing 
that he gave to the people. So our closing song today is Aaron's Blessing. Words are maybe just to help us sing it. The words are sung by a solo and then will be repeated by other singers. So yeah, maybe we can sing that repeat part. You know? Actually, you can sing if you want or you don't have to. Just let these words be God's blessing to us.